following interviews and commentaries are for entertainment only. The views and opinions expressed therein are those of the individual speakers and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Sheranian Communications, KHQN, or Utah Valley Live. Good afternoon and welcome to Steve Shank on Food. I'm your co-host Kim Power Stilson here with Steve Shank, food expert, author, and also noted philanthropist. I'm so great to have you us back together here on this new show. Thank you for all those who have watched the show. We've had some great comments on non-GMO and you know about the food, the drought, the situation. This is always the place to tune in to watch to see what's happening. And thanks to Roku Box and Facebook, and also you can find the show on SteveShank.me. Heck of a deal. Thanks to you, Stream, I'm just too. so excited to be here. I get to sit next to a gorgeous woman and, and talk for half an hour, 45 minutes, or an hour. And I'm just going to sit here and talk. <laughs> well, for those of you watching, we, as much as we love Steve to talk about whatever, we have been really excited to hear about the latest on the drought. Uh, it's all over the newspapers, Time Magazine, articles every day on local newspapers across the nation talking about the drought and the food shortage. And if you want to have the answers and find a solution, this would be the place to tune in. Heck of a deal. Absolutely. You know, the drought is a, a very interesting enigma. A lot of people... We get a lot of questions about why food costs are so terribly high. Um, and fascinating thing that we're discovering, we've been tracking this for, for a lot of years, but over the last 10 years, if you look at, the, at the, the graph of the cost of gasoline and the graph, the graph of the cost of food, they're actually overlays, Kim. You can, you, can, you know, when, when gas goes up, food goes up. Gas goes down, food goes down, but uh, neither one of them go down very much. And which usually goes up first? Um, that's like asking which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, in this case, I'm not sure which it is, the chicken or the egg, but the fact is is that um, oftentimes the gas will lead just a little bit, but there's so much lag in the market. For example, um, the transportation costs of food have to be added in, and so as soon as the gas goes up, the food has to go up because the transportation costs go in, and so it's 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 a it's a foot race. And not a lot of people understand that because we've seen articles out there on the internet with with people kids saying that their kids did not realize that hamburgers came from cows, which are oh, fed man. by grass, which are also produce milk, which they drink in their milkshakes, which they eat with their burger. Yeah, well. <laughs> It's an age-old thing that uh, kids in some of the inner city areas, inner city areas, think that milk come, milk comes out of a carton, and they have no concept of the cow. Um, unfortunately, for those of us that are dealing with food, and all of us really are, um, that's not the case. If we could just make more cartons, if that was the case, but the drought's a very interesting thing. What's happening is that we've lost in many areas about seventy percent of our corn crop. Now, people don't realize this, Kim, but uh, corn or corn byproducts and things like that are affecting about 70-75% of the food that we have in the grocery store. Um, if you walk down, usually around the outside of a grocery store, you find the fresh fruits and vegetables and the stuff that isn't packed. The center aisles are the ones that are boxed and, and prepared. And those are just fraught with corn products. But what people don't realize, you know, the average person sits out there and says, okay, so the farmers are not going to make that much this year, uh, so they're losing the corn crop. I hate to tell you this, but it affects everything. Because corn is the basis for all of the animal livestock feeds uh, that we have out there, and that is food. You talk, at your, you talk about your poultry and your dairy products. Uh, and Fed by corn. Yeah, absolutely. Everything's fed by corn. And here's... Part of what people are, are, are dealing with, they don't realize. Ethanol, the mandate to use corn for ethanol, um, if you think about it and look at countries like Brazil where they're using sugarcane and things like that, that 
that are much more efficient. Um, it, it really is a silly choice as a an alternate fuel or a biofuel. But the now, fact why is, is that? Um, well, a couple things. First of all, corn is being subsidized for ethanol. In other words, the government pays the farmers that grow corn a little bit extra of a, of a spiff in order to get them to grow the corn for the ethanol, which means that the, the growers that are growing the corn for our food or to feed our food, as it were, are having to decide whether they're going to go grow corn for fuel or go, grow corn for, for our food. And so as a result, they got one choice. They have to either, well, they have to raise the price of our food. So that's why no matter what happens, you're going to have a situation where the food and the fuel are going to be matched almost perfectly. And so that's kind of what we're dealing with. Choice. Yeah. So the, incentor, the incentives the farmers are getting to grow the corn for the fuel are maybe outweighing this uh, need for producing corn that feeds the cows and the chickens and all the food producing. And us. And us. <laughs> Yeah. I had corn on the cob, right? Yep, there you go. It's more than corn on the cob. But so as a result of putting this all together, uh, what what people are looking at is we have a severe food shortage in this country. Um, many of you have, have heard me say that in 1959, the United States of America could, could literally produce enough food to feed the entire planet five times over. Now we're importing about 40% of our food. Um, can you explain what you mean by importing? Where is that food coming from? Um, it's coming from all over. A lot of it, oddly enough, is coming from China. <laughs> <Oops. laughs> yeah, that's so. Our corn, some of our corn, or other rice or other products are coming from China. Yeah, and and you also have, in in order to create this food shortage, we've got a perfect storm. We, we're in the seventh year of a worldwide famine. That means that there's drought all over the place. China uh, has serious drought. India has serious drought. Australia has serious drought. And so the continents are not getting the rainfall that they need to grow the crops that they need. And so some of these larger population countries are running around farming the rest of the planet. In other words, coming into the United States where the farmers are having a hard time getting loans to, to plant and harvest their crops, uh, the Chinese are coming in and saying, hey, We'll, we'll pay for all that, and then we'll give you the profit from your crops. The only difference is, is we're going to take it out of the country back to China to, to feed our people. So, so to survive, a lot of our farmers are send it, selling their crops and their land rights too, to Chinese investors. And other countries. The, Germ uh, the Germans are coming in. The French are coming in. We've got all sorts of activities. And one of the things that's happening is that no one is admitting that we have a food shortage in this country. You don't see it on the media, but you see it with your pocketbook. And so now as, as we come in on October, right, right now we're, we're getting plenty of food to supply us, even though the prices are going up and up and up and up. So when you see a newscast at night that says drought affects prices, you may not see your spaghetti going yeah. up that day. Okay. No, not till October. So you maybe don't believe it as much either. Oh, absolutely. But we should then. Well, people... People typically function from a, an interesting principle. If the dog ain't biting me, then dogs don't bite. Uh, if I can still afford to buy my groceries, then I'm good. The, the problem is, is that half the population of the United States is being subsidized some way or another for their groceries. Um, we got churches, we got the government, obviously. In fact, the government is now advertising to the baby boomers uh, to get on food stamps. So what you're saying is 50% of Americans need help in... To buy their groceries. Okay, so right. some kind of subsidy, and so they can't afford what they have now, and it's going to get worse. True. That's okay. true. And you put this together, we've had more natural disasters worldwide in the last year than we've had in the last four or five years, all put together. And then we've got the people that are concerned about the alignment of the planets with the 2000... 2012, this, uh, the December The Mayan calendar. 21st. Yeah, yes. the Mayan calendar. But, All over the internet. But here's an interesting thing. It's not just the Mayan calendar. It's the Hopi calendar. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with Nostradamus. He's, a, he's an old 
guy that you know read tea leaves and no, he really didn't read tea leaves, but he was a, he was a seer that's written a lot about the various events, and he saw that that end time right around 2012 also, and uh, we've got the timeline and the Great Pyramid and Cheops, and so we've got about five or six different sources that many people look at as being significant uh, all coming together. So you've got that, you've got the weather conditions, you've got a, a, a huge economic issue. Right now many people are calling what we're in the Greatest Depression as opposed to the Great Depression was back in the 30s. And so you put this all together and food is going to become the next currency. Well, And you remember the, the famous photos from the Great Depression with the food lines where people, endless lines, queues of people stood just to have a loaf of bread. And, and could not, um, usually, there was not enough usually to go around. And mm -hmm. then in Europe, what well, I think with inflation after the war, bread was like 40 marks or something, which oh. would be equivalent of like 40, almost $40. It, it's, it's, well. That would be hard to, to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for your kids if you had to pay $40 for a loaf of bread. Yeah, particularly in this country, since we have food allergies that are affecting the peanut butter and no, and no school can have peanut butter next to it. But anyway, be that as it may. Another that's show. That's another show. <laughs> yes. But, um, Back in, in uh, Germany, the inflation rate was such that a loaf of bread doubled in cost daily until they were paying in terms of a billion marks. They had to start printing larger bills just so people could take that much paper in and, and buy stuff. Now, over in, in Russia, when this kind of... Uh, Activity started with the inflation in U Ukraine and some of those areas. Where, but when they devalued the uh, ruble and that type of thing, uh, you had a situation where the women go, would go down to the government store and the men would go to work. And there was a chain link fence between the factory and the government store. Okay, at lunchtime, they would pay the men for that day's work. And they would pass it through. The fence the fence to their wives who would then buy that day's food and it took about all they had in order to buy the food that day. That's how this happens. And that's that's the track that we're on, by the way. Well, and it's not to scare anybody. This is this this has happened before. And so oh, just yeah. about, you know, looking at current economic conditions and, and the drought, et cetera, and just being aware of what's going on and and asking yourself if, you know, that kind of thing happened, would you easily be able to pass your money through the fence and buy the bread. Would you be able to handle standing in a line like that? Well, the problem is, is that uh, back then, there wasn't that much of a food shortage. It just that, that people didn't have the, the money to get it. Now, when the farmers can't get the loans to plant, what happens is you have almost a dust bowl situation. Um, because... What keeps the dust? What keeps the dirt in <laughs> on the on the field that it's in is all the plant growth and everything. When the farmers don't plant, then you have a bare field, and then you have the winds that come across, and they will actually blow the topsoil of that that field over to the next state. And uh, they were getting a lot of Kansas on the east coast during the the, the Great Dust Bowl period of, of time, which which was right around the Great Depression. So the economic circumstance of the country affects the ability to grow. So you've got, you've got a vicious cycle. So what we're dealing with right now is a very fearsome situation. There could be a disaster where there's an earthquake. There could be uh, a, a situation where you've got a storm coming in or, or we've had a lot of storms. Uh, we had Japan, where they had the earthquake. Right. The, the incidence of earthquakes worldwide over the last year has been absolutely horrendous. And so you put this all together, and it's kind of like cooking frogs. Um, you know how to cook a frog? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. It sounds not very tasty. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we had an experience with that last week. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of want to hear about that, too. <laughs> no, you don't really want to hear about that. But what... What happens is if you want to cook a frog, if you take a pot of water and put it on the stove and toss the frog in, he's going to hop right back out. He's not going to like to stay in there. And so 
what you do is you take the pot of water and you take cold water and you put it on the stove and you put the frog in there. He's, he's paddling around in there. And I've told this story before on the program, but it applies to what's happening to us here in America right now. And so what happens is the heat gets turned up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and it just gets warmer and warmer, but the frog never really notices, notices it until he's cooked. And so what's happening is we don't notice that, yes, eggs are going up, you know, an extra 10 or 15%. And didn't they go up 10% last week? You know, that yes. type of thing. And we don't connect the fact that when you see 10% ethanol on your gas tank or on, on you know on your on your uh, fuel the pump, pump stickers, yeah. yeah uh that that is made from the corn that could have fed the cow that you now can't afford to buy the hamburger from you got you can't connect all this stuff up and it's happening so slowly and so gradually that basically like cooking frogs well I guess I'm cooking frogs because this week I did some packing. My daughter's off to college, so, you know, that's a whole other topic, too. And I pulled out some spaghetti that I had put away in storage. Yeah. And the sticker on, the fact that it had sticker was amazing, too. The, the sticker said 59 cents on the spaghetti. Mm -hmm. And right next to it, I pulled out um, some spaghetti to send my daughter off with for school, yeah. and it was $2.19, same brand. So that I don't know how long I've had that spaghetti, but I thought that was that's like the the, the frog story. It's true. That's significant. You don't realize how quickly we it probably comes up. need to take a break. We do. We need to take a break. You're listening to Steve Shank on food. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be right back after this brief commercial break. Have you ever realized that freedom is spelled F-O-O-D? Food. After air and water, food is our greatest dependency. Taking control of that dependency ensures personal power, independence, and freedom. We can't control earthquakes, storms, martial law, dollar crash inflation, the global warming hoax, farm and garden restrictive legislation, job loss, crop failures, or the 2012 planet disruptions. However, if we have our own food, none of these can control us. Hunger can never be used to control you if you never are forced to stand in a bread line because you do not have your own bread. It seems the only freedom we still have control of is possession of food. If we don't control our own food, events are rapidly moving to use food to control us. Freedom truly is spelled F-O-O-D. Contact eFoodsDirect.com or call 800-409-5633. That's eFoodsDirect.com or 800-409-5633. Welcome back to Steve Shank on Food. Thank you so much for joining us. Steve Shank here, food expert, author of It's Not Your Fault. We've been talking about the drought and situations in history that have made it difficult to feed families. And Steve was talking before the break about, you know, it's like boiling frogs. It, it just kind of if it just kind of happens. And pretty soon, before you know it, the spaghetti that was 59 cents is now 219. Yeah, and what's happening in America is about 20,000 families per day 20,000 families per day are falling below the poverty line. the lot well and and so what are we going to do we've got we've got weather conditions we've got end time stuff going on now a lot of people after y2k are looking at 2012 like yeah it's and saying yeah 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 um but there might be something to it because what we've got is we've got a change in the weather patterns. We've got a change in the, the, the volcanic activity. And when we put this whole thing together, uh, we've got some serious food issues. Back several years ago, I think many of you have heard me say that we lost a huge percentage of the bees on the planet. 
and they're responsible for pollinating our crops. So we've got we've got a drought, we've got famine worldwide, we've got other countries coming in and buying up our food because we don't have export restrictions, and we've got a, a lot of people right now with the economy the way it is, not knowing whether they can afford the next meal, and so everything comes. All roads lead to food, and. So well, you what's, eat it every day. I mean, three oh, meals yeah. a day if you're lucky. That's right. And what's happening is that that a lot of people are really getting concerned, and there's more activity in storing up food than there's ever been, and rightly so, because it's very possible that before the end of this year, when we find out how severe the crop losses were when we when we actually get into the harvest and they are able to make the predictions in October of this year, uh, it could be a situation where where everyone should be deeply concerned about whether they're even going to be able to buy food. So there's a concept that the old timers used to use. My daddy was born in 1887, so between the two of us, we covered a whole lot of this this nation. Yeah, I know he was 62 when I was born, um, and I wasn't a mistake. How many kids in your family? Uh, uh, six, and I was the tail light. You were the baby, okay? Yeah, I was the tail light, not the baby. So anyway, <laughs> but. Uh, and so the old timers always had a supply of food, and because uh, I remember when there weren't when there weren't supermarkets like we we see today. And so what did you have instead? Well, we um, we canned a lot of stuff uh, out here in this part of the country. They call it bottling. We used to call it canning, you know. Yeah. But uh, my mom would put up a lot of preserves and a lot of uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables, and then we'd eat on those during the winter time. So what had happened is that. Uh, we, no matter whether we had a good crop that year or not, were able to get by, and that's what the old timers had to do. Now, a lot of people don't have more than a week's worth of food if sure. they had to stretch everything, including, uh, you know, uh, I was going to make an obscene statement, but never mind. Uh, cooking all this, <laughs> anything that they've got available to, to eat. But we've also been weakened a great deal in terms of our willingness to prepare for ourselves. Because we have the welfare program with with the uh, with the government, and one of the problems that we have with that is if there is a large scale disaster, they don't have any food either. FEMA doesn't have food to work with, and so it's just uh, something that every it's kind of every man for themselves. So what people are going to have to do is deal with two things. A lot of people are getting to the point where they can't afford food. The answer to that is to buy your food ahead of time at today's prices so when it gets to the point where you can't afford it, you've got some food stored in. A lot of people in Utah area think in terms of a year's supply of food. Most other people in other parts of the country think we're half a bubble off with one oar in the water, a brick shy of a load of taco short of a blue place special. The elevator doesn't go to the tops and the lights are on, but nobody's home. And I can give you a quarter if you, sit, you can say that back to me. But they think that we're kind of nuts because they've never had to. My daddy lived to be 96 years old. And about two years before he died, he said, son, I was already involved with this food and preparation stuff a bit. He said, son, one of the problems we've got here in America is people have had it too good for too long. And it's probably true. This generation of, of families raising children and those children that are teenagers and, and down, have no concept of ever having had a shortage of food. If you look at the previous generations, the old timers that lived through the, de the Depression and their children always have some sort of a supply of food set back. They, they know that any kind of a savings account, if a guy has $10,000 in cash and $10,000 worth of food and there's no food, <laughs> who's going to eat? That's going to be worth a lot more. They ain't going to sell the food, no matter how much cash or gold or whatever you have. That's why we say to, to families that food literally, and if you can get a storable food, now you, there are all sorts of food storage companies out there, so you have to be extremely careful. And we'll talk about that on the next show, so make sure you tune in. Yep, we'll talk about that. But there are a lot of food storage companies out there, and you have to be careful what they put into the stuff because... Uh, Right now, a lot of people are scared, and they're buying just about anything they can put in, and you have to read the labels and make sure it's not going to make you glow in the dark, walk sideways, and one eye travel to the other side of your head. But the fact is that people 
are storing right now more than they have in the last two generations because they realize that there are two things that you can do by storing food. You can freeze the availability of food. When food is no longer available and when you can't get enough stuff, and I know this is a stretch for a lot of you, but trust me, just as sure as I'm sitting here looking ugly, there will come a time very shortly when there will be shortages such that people will say, I thought that we'd always have food here in this country. Not so. At the supply end where we're buying for the for the foods that we're producing to ship out to you, we're we're running into situations where it's difficult to get food that's clean. The second thing that you do is you freeze the cost. If you buy it at today's prices, when it goes up 20, 30, 40 percent within the next six months, which it probably will do, uh, you have bought your food ahead, and if it's storable, you can set it back just like a savings account. And that's why I say that the next, the very next currency is going to be food. There will come a time, there was a leader of a very significant church in this country way back in pioneer times that made the statement, there will come a time in this country where you will not be able to buy a loaf of bread with a bushel of gold. And that's a lot of gold, but that means that there's going to be some severe food shortages. Now, other countries are, are feeling it. But in the United States right now, we're experiencing right now it's in the form of high prices. Very soon it's going to be in the form of no availability. There are very, very, very large number of companies that when they run out of some items, grocery stores, they replace them with the items that they have. So that's the story for today. So tune in next week for Steve Shank on Food. Thanks for joining us and join us on Facebook.